Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. Marianne Jean-Baptiste is a classically trained actor who has over 50 credits in what has to be one of the most varied resumes in all of acting. Her breakthrough part was in Secrets and Lies, the acclaimed British drama from the 1990s directed by Mike Lee. The role earned her a Best Supporting Actress nomination at the Academy Awards. In 2002, she got a lead part on the American TV show Without a Trace. She played an FBI agent named Vivian Johnson for seven years. You might also have seen her recently in Homecoming. Her latest film is a departure from all of that, though. It's called In Fabric. It's a movie that, I mean, well, look, there isn't a more elegant way to say this. It's a movie about a haunted dress. It is a bizarre, psychedelic movie about a haunted dress. A beautiful, striking red dress that literally burns itself into the person who wears it. It's a dress that's worshipped by occultists. And in In Fabric, Marianne Jean-Baptiste's character is the first person unlucky enough to buy it. In the scene you're about to hear, Sheila Woodchapel, her character, has just tried it on for the first time in a strange, almost church-like department store. Isn't it small? What size is this? 36. But I'm not a 36. In a number is only the equation of actuality. Dimensions and proportions transcend the prisms of our measurements. You're not getting any more in? There's a lucky man somewhere in the vista of this mysterious mirror. May I ask his name? His name's Adonis. Marianne Jean-Baptiste, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. As I was watching that scene in particular, uh, which is pretty early on in the film, mm. I thought to myself, what would it be like to get the script in the mail for this <laughs> film? <laughs> like To like look at that list of words. I know. <laughs> So my first question is, what was it like <laughs> to get that script in your email inbox or your uh, your mailbox outside your front door? Well, it was pretty amazing, actually. I got the script from my agent in England uh, with the offer letter and sort of saying, you know, if you're going to do it, it's going to be here and da 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 And he, the first thing he, he wrote, he sent the script and he said, OK, I absolutely love this filmmaker. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but I'm I'm really into what he does, etc. But it's not your average kind of, you know, storytelling. So I was like, okay, cool. This sounds great. Then I get another email quite swiftly with, don't read it yet. Watch these. And, you know, links to Barbarian Sound Studio and uh, Duke of Burgundy. But it was too late. I'd already started. I mean, I was intrigued, so I'd already started it. And I was reading through and thinking, this is either going to be brilliant or it's not going to work at all. But the way in which it's written, I want to know. Do you know what I mean? And it will be worth trying to find whatever it is. Then I saw his work and I thought, I've got to do it got to do it. I love this mind, this crazy kind of unusual, really quite unique way of telling stories. Did you make any adjustment to your performance style based on what the film was going to be or what he told you to do? Or did you approach it the same way you would approach anything else? Um, I approached it pretty much the way I'd approach everything else although you know we talked about certain things to do with the style of it for example in the car 
I get into the car, we're going to go driving. So I'm like, okay, this is she's in England, so it's going to be stick shift and it's changing gears. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want you to do any of that. I just want you to hold the, the steering wheel up high and gaze just below the um, rear view mirror. And I was like, what? It doesn't look like <laughs> nobody drives like that. And he's like, no, you're not supposed to look as if you're driving. I'm in a car. What else would I be doing? Because no, we're gonna we're gonna put the same scenery behind you. It's just gonna keep going in a loop, like the, those old movies and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'll go with it. Let's go. Okay, fine. Let's go. In that scene that we heard, your mm. character buys this red dress, mm. and she's buying it to go on a date. She's found out that her kid's dad is seeing someone, they're separated, mm -hmm. and she like circles a classified ad, like a Lonely Hearts ad. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wears the dress on this date, and it is, I'm just gonna play the scene, it is very distinctive. <laughs> so, you like dancing then? Not tonight, I sprained my ankle. God, I didn't mean tonight, just in general. You like dancing? Yeah. It says in your Lonely Hearts advertisement that you like laughing. Yeah. What kind of things? Funny things. What about cooking? Uh, what is this, an exam? <laughs> He's just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to that scene now, I was thinking it was funny. And watching it earlier, it was, like, upsetting. Like, there's a suffocation scene in the film later on, and, mm. and it felt the same way the suffocation scene felt. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Like, right, it right. really just dances on the edge of this is so absurd and ridiculous mm -hmm. that it is funny, but it is also so specific that it is scary. Yeah. It's disturbing. I think yeah. it, it, what what he's very, very good at is unsettling you. Even in those moments of comedy, you kind of like, it's it's bizarre. You don't know where this is going to go. Do you know what I mean? He, what is he going to pull out of that suitcase? A wilting rose or a bloody machete? You know, because, ugh, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your life. You grew up in... South London. Yeah. Where particularly in South London did Peckham. you grow up? Now, what is Peckham like? Peckham, South East London. Well, when I was growing up in Peckham, it was a very working class neighborhood with housing estates and stuff. Is a, is a housing estate what we would call a, is a public housing project? Yeah, public housing. Lots of outside activity. Do you know what I mean? Everybody played outside. And, you know, people from one project... And the other projects, they'd all get together and play big games of things. Like we have this game called Rounders, which is a bit like your baseball. And it would be like about 30, 40 kids all playing that. Yeah, it was a fairly mixed neighbourhood when I was growing up. I would say it was, it was a bit of a dodgy area. Not as bad as some, but it had its edge, you know. It was a bit edgy. Was it like you kind of got to keep your chin up when you're walking around? Yeah, yeah. You had, to, I mean, everybody kind of knew everyone and who was thing, but you had to be very aware of what was going on and when and who. I know that you're a pretty serious musician. Um, yeah. Did you have music in the house when you were a kid? All the time, yeah. My dad played several instruments. What did he play? A lot self taught. He played the piano, the guitar. Um, the violin, clarinet. Clarinet seems like a hard one to, te to teach yourself. I know. <laughs> like, I took classes I guess, at I'd like school. just be holding the clarinet in one hand and the reed in the other hand and just going, Yeah, ah. Those instruments are quite tricky. I learned the clarinet at school and did a bit of that, and I was just like, oh, the squeaking. <laughs> it's just... A I had more squeaks than anything else, so I put that down. What kind of music did he play? Quickly. Jazz, you know. Um, for the at-home listener, you made the, the hand symbol. You made the hand symbol for. Eh. 
Yeah, jazz-ish. In the ha- like records wise, he had a very eclectic taste. So we would have calypso, jazz, reggae, classical music. He loved Handel. So, you know, you'd have the fireworks, you'd have the Messiah, the waterworks, all that stuff. And then occasionally the Mighty Sparrow. And then occasionally, yes, Sugar Boom Boom, Lord Kitchener, and all that stuff. We would have that. Did you think you were going to be a musician or did you have a practical idea in mind? Oh my God. I wanted to be a barrister. I wanted to be a lawyer. Why is that? So I could perform in court, mm-hmm. closing arguments. That's what it was about mm-hmm. in retrospect. You wanted to be a, lo- a television lawyer. You wanted to be <laughs> well, like Perry Mason or whatever. Well, Perry I Mason grew up watching the paper chase yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think that's what it was about, being able to stand up and argue. How far did you go down that road? Not very far. I took a gap year. And in that year, I did a lot of studio singing sessions How old to make you? money. 18. So I did a lot of studio sessions, like backing singing and bits and pieces and some theatre. And I thought, I might as well get my equity card while I'm at it for the year. And then I thought, you know what? I quite like this. I don't want to do anything else. I'm going to apply for drama school. So I did. I'm going to play a little clip of you singing. This is, <gasps> yes, you sound great. Uh, oh, no. You'll hear, this is from a theater promo from a few years ago. So it is you singing for the benefit of a photographer. So you'll hear the photographer clicking, clicking, yes. clicking in the background. And that character couldn't sing. Well, I've got a preface. <laughs> you sound like a, then you did a bad job okay. because you sound really good. <laughs> I was listening to you talk to my buddy Aisha Tyler on her podcast, Uh! and um, you told her the name of a band you toured with. Oh, God. I I I was on the subway, and I was like, okay, I got to remember this so that I can spring it on her, but I'm going to let you spring it on uh, America's (laughs) public radio listeners. Flesh mesh yum yum. Yeah, flesh mesh yum yum. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> we were awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you were working the road. You said crazy. you were touring. You're, you were touring know. Europe. Yeah, we were. It was fun, but it was like you know, only young people could do it. <laughs> so you you ha- you have to be young and optimistic. <laughs> Jeez. Nobody has a midlife crisis and decides to start oh a band called God. Flesh Mesh Yum Yum. No. Oh God. What kind of band was it? I I couldn't even define the music we were making because we were so sort of like this. We can't be defined. You know, it's got a bit of rock in it. It's got some funk. It's got every. I mean, we had everything, punk, were everything. You, were you singing in the band? I was singing in the band, screeching. Did you wear outfits? No, we kind of would. No, You're we did. You were... No, there was a guy called Fitz who was the lead Flash guitar. Flash Yum Yum didn't have outfits. The lead guitarist, uh-huh. um, whose name was Fitz, whose real name. Uh, this is a really funny. I've got yeah. Anyway, um, his name was Fitz. And he wore all the outfits. He had gold teeth all across here, all the top row. And he wore extensions in his hair and stuff before it was kind of, you know. And he was was kind of the lead singer. I kind of shared that position with him. He was reluctant to share the position, though, because it was his band and he would have tantrums. He was from Montserrat. I mean, I worked with him for months. 
And um, and I was sort of one day I sort of said, "What's Fitz short for?" He's like, "Like Fitzgerald, Fitzroy, blah blah blah." And he went, "No, my name's Eric." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Yeah, they called me Fitz because I had epilepsy when I was a kid, so they just it, the name just stuck." I swear, I laughed so much because obviously being ca- Caribbean, he was from Montserrat. My mum's from Antigua. There were so many stories of people who had these names. You thought their name was one thing and you found out it was something else because they'd been given... There was a guy called Harvey. I thought his name was Harvey. But mum said, no, it's Harvey. I said, what's that for? She goes, because he's got one leg. (laughs) So they called him Harvey. (laughs) It's a cruel sense of humour. How did you end up at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, Rada? Wow, I auditioned. Did you have to, like, come out to your parents as an aspiring professional actor? I know, yeah. My mum was like, that's ridiculous. And my dad said, okay, do whatever you want to do as long as you do it well. Do it well. That's even worse than telling you not to do it. Yeah. That's like a real... That's real responsibility. It's very hard. Because you kind of go, yeah, he told me to do it, did it. And then you go... But now I've got to do it well. Okay, how do I do that then? <clears throat> yeah, my mother never, ever sort of accepted it in a funny <laughs> way. She'd always be like, when are you going to get a proper job? But mum, I've just been nominated for an Academy Award. Yes, but when will you settle down? Did you learn to do old-timey actor things like fence and ride horses oh yeah we did some fences man didn't do the horse riding i would have loved that yeah it seems like it'd be pretty yeah fun. we did the I, old... actually i take it back i would get motion sickness no yeah i think because it bounces up and down a lot oh i lo- well that's the best bit and my butt would hurt <laughs> no your butt does hurt after a while unless you're cushioned adequately i am not <laughs> 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 i'm gonna go ahead and stipulate that <laughs> Yeah, rapier and dagger. What did they call it? Um, Oh, no, we did movement for actors where you learn the polonaise and things like that, like you're going to need it if you're doing a Shakespeare and they decide that they're going to do some old Russian dance. We'll finish up with Marianne Jean-Baptiste after the break. When we come back, we'll talk about what it's like to play an FBI agent on network TV for seven years. I mean... How many expository interrogations can one person conduct? It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. News breaks and big stories change every day. That's why we're giving you NPR's 10-minute morning news podcast on Saturdays, too. I'm Scott Simon. And I'm Lulu Garcia-Navarro. Up first, start your day with us weekdays at 6 Eastern and Saturdays at 8, a bit later to suit your weekend from NPR News. Hi, I'm Allie Gertz. And I'm Julia Prescott. And we host Round Round Springfield. Springfield. Round Springfield is a new Simpsons podcast that is Simpsons adjacent. Mm -hmm. Um, In its topic, we talk to Simpsons writers, directors, voiceover actors, you name it, about non-Simpsons things that they've done. Because, surprise, they're all extremely talented. Absolutely. For example, David X. Cohen worked on The Simpsons, but then created a little show called Futurama. Mm -hmm. That's our very first episode. So tune in for stuff like that with Yardley Smith, with Tim Long, with different writers and voice actors. It's going to be so much fun. And we are every other week on MaximumFun.org or wherever you get your podcasts. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest, Marianne Jean-Baptiste, is an actor. She stars in the new thriller In Fabric, a brilliant and bizarre film about a haunted dress. She was also nominated for an Academy Award for her role in Mike Lee's Secrets and Lies. Were you familiar with Mike Lee's work before you went in to meet him or audition for him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd seen much of it, actually. A lot of his stuff for the BBC. Of course, Abigail's Party. We all grew up with that. So I'd I'd always loved his work and thought, oh, mate, the chance of working with him would be fantastic. What happened when you went in to audition? When I went in, the first time I actually met him was for Naked. And the audition was me visiting him in like a lounge. You had a sofa and you had tea and stuff like that that you could make and so on. And he kind of sat off and he said, "Okay, um, I'd just like you to just think of a character 
that you'd like to play and stuff and then just be the character in the space. Did you know that that's what you were kind of like, did your agent say, OK, when you go in to see Mike Lee, he's just going to tell you to be a character in, in a space? No, oh, they didn't boy. tell you anything. So I go in. And I sort of go, OK, then lovely. So I just sat there reading a newspaper. I made myself a cup of tea and read the newspaper for 45 minutes or so <laughs> while he watched. Um, and that was that. You really showed us how he watched, which was over the yeah. top of his glasses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, that guy would spy on you from different places. It's like, ugh. <laughs> That is like at the point where he said, I've auditioned for some acting jobs in my time and it's, I've never enjoyed it. But at the point where he said, well, I just want you to be a character in, in, in a space, uh, that's when I would have just started crying and laughed, basically. Really? Or just, yeah, like gotten too sick at my stomach and had to run to the bathroom. Oh, my God. That is horrifying to me. You know what it was? I was only too happy to sit. As long as I'm sat down, I wasn't going to play a, 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 I wasn't going to find a character that stood up for 45 minutes or an hour. Just make yourself comfortable and try not to peep at him. So be aware of where he is in the room, but just sort of like continue. Yeah. Were you tempted to be like a traffic policeman? <laughs> Uh, something no. something where you had some shtick? No. You know what's b funny about it is I, instinctively I kind of knew that the less I did, the more appealing it would be to him. Because that's the thing with improvisation. You And I've even done it sometimes with some young actors working with them, trying to get them to improvise. They think that they need to talk constantly and be something and do something. When really... You just want to be, just want to see if somebody can sit or, you know, do something really simple, nothing at all. And I think that, that I kind of got that that was the way to go. How long did you work on the movie before you started shooting the movie? Six, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Six months. I'm sorry, I'm moving away from the microphone because I wanted a sip of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you were also collapsing in laughter at the I thought was. of six how months. long you worked on that movie without I even know. shooting any movie. I know, six months rehearsal. <sighs> were you scared that you were not getting it right at any point? No. I mean, what your work in isolation, the character I played mm -hmm. was a bit of a loner. So I worked in isolation quite a lot, quite a lot. So in the six months, about three and a half of those six months was spent doing the birthing of that character, basically, and all the research and backstory that that character has to have, all the tools, the index box of facts and you know, relationships and all that sort of thing. So in that time, um, I had to find out where she grew up in London. I had to find the street she grew up on. I had to create the neighbours that lived on either side of her, who lived across the road. I had to find her school. I had to work out what bus she would have taken to school or if she walked and if those buses still exist, because sometimes they would shut numbers off so the number 12 doesn't run anymore from there to there it's now the number 73 but back now, in the day when you say you had to yeah were you like filling out a worksheet <laughs> literally listen it's like that because you'd have to report to him and he'd go okay where does she live okay and i'd get my notes out okay she lives on elmhurst road number 47 and who lives next door? Oh, the Caspers live on that side. They get on very well with those. But um, Hortense's mother doesn't like the older sons. They, they're a bit of troublemakers, da-da-da. And on the other side, there li lives those people and down there. And the church they go to is two bus stops away. I mean, yeah, you you literally have to do all that research and that work and talk to him about what you found, your findings. And then you study 
whatever they do for a, a living, you then go away and you do your um, placement. Let's hear a scene from Secrets and Lies. And this is one that I remember, like I, I saw Secrets and Lies, I mean, maybe I was, uh, when that come out, 1996? So I would have been a, I was in high school yeah. at the time. And I remember it from watching it in the theater in, in high school. And basically your character's name is Hortense and she is adopted and she's done some research into who her biological parents are. Mm -hmm. She finds out her biological mother is white, which is a big surprise. Mm -hmm. And your character calls her bio mom on the phone. Mm -hmm. And immediately the mom, Cynthia, hangs up, mm -hmm. finds out what's going, figures out what's going on and hangs up. And then you call back and we see the, the camera cuts, cuts back and forth between the two ends of the phone line. All right, I promise. Thank you. Um, c can I meet you somewhere? Oh, I shouldn't think so, darling. See, I've got lots of, um, I've got lots of questions I want to ask you. Yeah, well, I've got to go now. Please. What's your name, anyway? Hey? Hortense. Hortense? Yeah. Hortense what? Cumberbatch. Cumberbunch? That's a funny name, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose it is. <laughs> it's, it's such a it's such a gut punch. And oh, it's horrible. <laughs> when you listen to it, are you like reminded of the eight months of your life oh when you God. were that person? It was nine in total. But yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, some of it was very hard like that, you know, those moments like that. Because you really, because you are so in, it's like you feel it in a different way. And I think his whole thing, he's, the way that he, um, you're in character and you're in deep, but he gets you onto this system where he goes, come out of character. And by the, when he says come out of character, you literally have to come back right but if you don't this i mean that's the danger of staying in character cuz you it would you just get messed up the whole time i mean that is, that was horrible i've not seen the film for i don't watch the stuff that i'm in but i haven't seen that i saw that very early on but i haven't seen that for years that film it's really good yeah if you're wondering it's really good. Yeah, no, I know it is. Do you know what I mean? Um, I know it's a good film, you know, but, oof. You worked for a long time on a network cop show called Without a Trace, Indeed. FBI show. I guess that's not technically police, but that is like exactly the opposite job of being in Secrets and Lies. It is. <laughs> like that's you've got to make 40 minutes a week of television 30 or 40 percent of the dialogue has to be expository to move the plot and it's a lot of standing and looking stern and high status <laughs> but i guess you're you probably had you your kids were probably young when you started it's, yeah that's like young. the dream job for an actor with a family because you get to go home to your family yeah I mean, the first year of that was grueling because the hours were crazy. We were doing like ridiculous hours. And it wasn't really kid-friendly because, you know, you didn't get to see them. Well, I did because I would take the youngest to work with me. Um, but, yeah, it was tough. That was tough. It took me a few years to actually kind of get into the groove and understand how it worked, you know, and that this was a different world because you do, you go into it and you kind of go, but I want to create the character and the, she wouldn't wear Gucci. She'd wear Sears or, you know, Banana Republic or something like that. She's on an FBI salary. Why has she got Prada shoes? And But it's like, it's all about an aesthetic and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're making a television show, American television show. You're making 20-some of them a year. Mm. 
24. Yeah, it's a lot of that's a lot of hours of entertainment that mm. you're creating, and you're cr- trying to create a consistent viewing experience mm. for the like the audience wants to see the thing that they want to see. That's why they watch the thing. Yeah. Did you uh, during that time have times when you were like, I should be making art movies? Oh, every day. You think that. But then you kind of go, but I'm not making art movies. I'm doing this. So how the hell am I going to stay sane and do it? It's also like the greatest job ever as an actor. Like to be on a successful television show oh, is yeah. the dream. Oh, totally. And you can learn so much. I mean, I got to direct one of the episodes on the show. And you just get, you know what it was? Because I got to the point where I was just like, you know what? I've got to try and make this interesting and I want to be able to grow. I don't want to stay in that, you know, that horrible spot of phoning it in. So what I would do is I would invent these acting exercises for myself for, you know, so like the character Vivian, she'd be interrogating somebody, but I'd make her write her shopping list. So her grocery list at the same time so that she's got stuff going on. Do you know what I mean? Um, And just try and get that inner world. What's going on with her today? Because, I mean, on TV, we see there doesn't seem to be room for playing with. For example, you're interrogating someone. You interrogate people every bloody day. I mean, are you that focused? I mean, everything was just like serious, asking questions, blah, blah, blah. Are we all, do we all have that attitude? Like all of us FBI agents? Isn't one slightly doesn't care that much or, you know, got something else going on or... So it was really fighting to try and find those little moments where you could create something just, I don't know. Does this film represent you recommitting yourself to doing the weirdest thing you can find? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. And I want to emphasize, I really like the film. <laughs> I'm trying to not, I don't it. mean that pejoratively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Because for me, it's about the process, you know, and it kind of stopped being about that. I stopped enjoying the process because there was no process. So it's just finding things where somebody is going for something and it might not work. It's not about being result oriented. It's about the process trying to find it trying to you know tell stories in a different way well mary angel baptiste thank you so much for being on bullseye it was so great to get to talk to you likewise thank you i admire your work so much thank you mary angel baptiste her latest film is called in fabric it is truly a marvel i can't i A haunted dress movie doesn't even begin to describe how beautiful and mesmerizing the film is. If you haven't seen Secrets and Lies, for which Marianne was nominated for an Oscar, uh, one of the best movies I've ever seen, Uh, so you should definitely watch that. It's on the Criterion channel right now. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters, overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California, where just before the holidays, there was another park concert. Now, usually we get those park concerts during the summer concert series. Uh, This time it was a holiday show, a group of dads playing Christmas music and also one White Stripes cover. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our production fellows are Jordan Cowling and Melissa Duenas. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Our thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use it. And we have decades of interviews that you can listen to from past episodes of Bullseye. Uh, They're all at our website, MaximumFun.org. You can also find them in other channels uh, like YouTube, uh, your favorite podcast app, so on and so forth. For example, today on this show, we talked a lot about Mike Lee. Guess what? Last year, we interviewed Mike Lee. It was really great. Go listen to it. Uh, And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. 
Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.